Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Andrew Schwartz, and I work here in external relations. Uh, I'm so glad that you all joined us uh, this evening what, for what promises to be a truly fascinating discussion with Anjan here um, about his recently released book, and it's brand new, Stringer, A Reporter's Journey into the Con in the Congo. Um, I'd especially like to thank our partners at Internews for helping us put this event on, and specifically Internews' president and CEO, uh, Jeannie Borgald, who's here. Jeannie, where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Big round of applause for Jeannie. Um, Internews, if you don't know who Internews is, they're, they're basically the Peace Corps for journalists, okay? Internews is one of the most important organizations in Washington, and um, we want to thank them for their tire tireless work in training media professionals and citizen journalists all around the world. Um, a special thank you to my friend Ambassador uh, Bill Garvelink for joining us. Ambassador Garvelink is uh, currently a senior advisor at CSIS's project on U.S. leadership and development. Um, he was here permanently, and then we seem to have let him slip through our fingers to go on to do other cool things. And, uh, you know, it, it's so good to have Bill back here. Of course, uh, Bill was the United States ambassador to the DRC from 2007 until, until 2010. I'd also like to thank and welcome the director of our Africa program, Jennifer Cook, for her many years of putting on amazing Africa programming here at CSIS. And um, thank you so much for being here, Jennifer. Um, this event is exceptional in that we're going to hear uh, the perspectives of both a journalist uh, who covered a major world event and an ambassador who served during another chapter of that same event. Um, we're delighted that Anjan's here to share his experiences with us. Uh, and earlier this year, I don't know if you all saw, but Anjan was featured on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, which is the barometer of all things these days. Um, and on the show, um, Jon Stewart mentioned that as a stringer, for the Associated Press, the, o the AP only paid Anjan 15 cents per word for the articles he wrote. Well, so in light of that, we have a lot of books in the back for sale. So you can buy two or three to make up for the AP's, um, let's just say, uh, frivolousness. Yeah. Um, Anjan will also uh, be around to sign books afterwards if, if uh, you want to stick around. Uh, Anjan studied at Yale and gave uh, up the opportunity to work at Goldman Sachs for the chance to experience the uncertainty of an indefinite sojourn in the Congo. Um, there's many things that spoke to me about this book uh, when Carolyn Powers first um, introduced uh, the book to me, but what really spoke to me personally um, was Anjan's desire to bear witness to events that the rest of the world was ignoring. You know, as, as I read his book, I recalled a letter that um, General Eisenhower wrote in April of 1945 to the then Army Chief of Staff, uh, George Marshall, regarding his recent visit to a Nazi concentration camp. Ike said, quote, I made the visit deliberately in order to be in position to give firsthand evidence of these things if ever in the future there develops a tendency to, char to charge these allegations merely to propaganda, end quote. Anjan, your work has sealed the experiences of the Congolese in the pages of history, um, and we're very proud of everything you've done. Um, you've done the world a great service by taking the road less traveled, and I hope that your book will inspire others, uh, including my three boys, to do the same. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest, Anjan, right here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, very kind, and thank you also, a special thanks to our host tonight, uh, CSIS and Internews. Very proud and happy to be here. We're, we're here to talk about Congo, a place where five or six million people have died over the past 20 years. Uh, this is what some describe as the worst war in the world, uh, one of the great events of our time. And in my book, Stringer, which is a memoir, I explore two themes. The first is trying to make sense of this crisis in which five or six million people have died. And the second is to understand how we report on it. The kind of news that we tell people back home and tell each other, uh, the stories that we tell each other about Congo. When I arrived in Congo, I was 
the fourth foreign journalist in the country. Uh, and I was a stringer. The other three were living in suites in the Intercontinental, in uh, fancy colonial bungalows with uh, white-loved servants, and, and re really nice accommodations. And I, I was living in, in Islam. And the, the street that I lived on, I remember, there were families down the road that did not have enough money to, for everyone to eat. So every day they would choose one person who would eat on that day, and the others would scavenge for food. There were houses across from our house where parents told their daughters to go out and fend for themselves, which meant they had to prostitute themselves. And this was accepted, not talked about, but accepted as something that was necessary. I met some of these children on one of my first reporting trips outside uh, my home. I met some of these children who had been abandoned. And because families were unable to feed them, they had to severe ties to those children. And they would accuse them of being possessed by the devil. And these children would go off and live in this cemetery in the middle of Kinshasa, uh, in these carcasses of cars. And uh, one of the first trips I made was to go out and spend a night with them to understand the kind of lives they led. Through much of the book, well, one of the themes that runs through much of the book is the difference in the stories that we tell each other. And uh, this, the news that I w was expected to report from the Congo. And the stories that people, for example, in my family, the family I lived with, would tell each other about Congo. There was a great divorce, a great divide between the kinds of stories that were told. And I was very much aware that the stories that I was writing were to become the official, in some way, record of history of that country. People would refer to these reports for the AP as what happened in that country at that time. But it, it was extremely striking to find that it had almost no relation, or very little, to the stories that my family told their children at home. And through much of the book, I grappled with this. And I tried in the book to describe these stories and, and write these down so the reader can understand the stories that are not told and that, that are told with great difficulty by a few journalists and then read and quickly forgotten. In the middle of the book, uh, desperate to find a story because it was so hard to publish on the Congo, I traveled up the river with an Indian businessman to his mine. And uh, what, what I found up in this jungle in, in northern Congo was not a, a, a country completely abandoned as I had expected, but I found a people caught up in global forces, international dynamics to an extent that I had not expected. People asked me not for money, but for metal detectors. I met a, uh, I did find the story that I was looking for. I, I found a pygmy tribe that had given away huge sections of their forest for a few sacks of salt. And they didn't understand the, the value of their forest. When I asked them why they had done that, they said, look at the forest, it never ends. Who can destroy all this? It's impossible. And, and that, that was something that really got to me, that these people were there so far away. and. Uh, their stories were not being told. The other thing that I discovered in that area was a mass grave. A mass grave left not by, by some Congo, by a coalition of Congolese armies and neighboring countries. And so you begin to realize, even in the outbacks, the scale and the, the dynamics, the international forces that are at play in a place like Congo. But what I want to talk about most, perhaps, uh, in my book, and in some of my work is the importance of information. Towards the end of the book, I describe a, an episode where I'm in a border town just before the elections. And this was Congo's first elections in 40 years, first free elections in 2006. It was a major event. I met people, women who'd walked three days from their village to come to a polling station to cast their ballot. It was that important to them. And just before the vote, a militiaman came to a hill outside our town. And the rumors began to fly. 
he's going to come and massacre us because he had a, a terrible reputation, this militiaman. And he's going to massacre us, he's going to kill us, he's going to, uh, he's against the election uh, because that would bring, bring a legitimate power uh, into government. And in all this chaos, this was only 15 kilometers away from where we were. And in all this chaos, the only way to find out what was going on was to go there and meet him, and I did. And by the way, I found out that he had once been a nurse for the Red Cross. <laughs> so you begin to see the complexity of the stories that, you, that, that, that are to be unearthed in these places. But if we cannot know what is happening 15 kilometers from where we are, and this is often the case in these war zones, in these conflict zones, then how are we to devise policies from 2,000 kilometers away in Washington. And this is one of the things that I'd like to stress, and also where the work of our two hosts tonight, uh, Mary, Internews works to build networks of local journalists who can help us be better informed about these places, because that's the only way in the end that we will be informed through local informers, reliable sources, local debate. And CSIS crafts international policy to help places like Congo to confront the challenges of conflict minerals and, and other issues that are still alive in Congo. And, and so it is my, my hope, and I'm very glad that we've had this event tonight with our two hosts, because it is my hope that with better information, we can craft more effective international policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What we thought we'd do was um, uh, hear a little bit, uh, have uh, Ambassador Garvelink talk a little bit about kind of the broader context, those international forces, the policy mm. perspective on, on this. And what your book provides is this kind of very granular kind of immediate experience that you had in, in a, a very poor neighborhood, kind of the ups and downs of that. The, um, you know, what I appreciated was kind of your honesty in, uh, how unprepared you were, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, kind of, you're, you know, you get a sense of irritability, you know, you're not yes. having a great mm -hmm. time, it's very difficult, you get robbed twice in the, you know, in the first, uh, first couple of months that you're there, you know, moments of panic, mo moments of fear, and, uh, you know, I, I think you don't come across as coming in as the, you know, uh, you know bold explorer, it's kind of, oh my gosh, what, a, what have I, gotten into, and I, mm -hmm. I think that's, um, that's a really interesting part of, of the book. So it's as much about Congo as kind of your, your experience there, and, and, and I, I really appreciated that. Um, but this is all playing out, this, these kind of granular stories in this much bigger context, as you say, and those, mm -hmm. those two narratives are sometimes divorced. Um, you were there in the run-up to the 2006 elections, which in the aftermath was quite violent in Kinshasa. Yes, yes. And, you know, the Electoral mm -hmm. Commission was, was attacked, for example, mm -hmm. and I think you were hunkering down looking for a way out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, Congo has so many layers of kind of complication of the local conflicts, the regional conflicts, and the international forces that you speak of, that it makes it a huge diplomatic conundrum as well. And so yeah. we thought uh, maybe Ambassador Garvelink could say a little bit about that period and how things have changed sure. since then. Yeah, I, no, thanks. And uh, I, the, first of all, I, the book is very interesting to me because of, of the uh, examples you cite and the, uh, the, the living in a different part of Kinshasa than I lived in. And, um, but it rings true. Uh, when we would venture into some of the poor areas and talk to people and when we travel down the uh, Congo River and some of the same experiences you've had. And so it's, it's, it's sort of, it's a very interesting uh, perspective that gets, as you say, in fact, unfortunately, gets lost a lot on the diplomatic side of things. That these are antidotes that you talk about and you never really report on and you know about them and you talk about them in your embassy and that sort of thing, but the reporting back and forth to Washington and with your other ambassador colleagues, you don't really get into that sort of stuff. So you, you lose a lot of, of 
what's really important in the day-to-day -day life of people. Mm -hmm. But this, the, you were there 2005 and 2006, and this is uh, a really critical period in the Congo. It's just to, very briefly, I, I assume most of the folks here probably know that, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. The, after the genocide in Rwanda, you know, a lot of the, the genocidaires moved into the Congo, and from 2006 and seven was the first Congo war where you had the appearance of Laurent Kabila, and Rwanda and uh, some of his pals that, that ended up taking over in 2007. Mobutu left and got out of the country. And then uh, from uh, 1998 until 2003, uh, there was the second Congo War or the wor World War, because nine countries were involved in that, and 20 to 30 odd rebel groups were engaged in that war. And then uh, in 2001, President Kabila uh, the, uh, the elder, the old one, uh, was assassinated, and Joseph Kabila, the first president, came in in 2001. <clears throat> and then there were negoti negotiations going on for peace agreements in a variety of countries, and they finally signed a peace accord in Pretoria in 2003, which created a transitional government uh, with, with Joseph Kabila as the provisional head and four vice presidents, uh, Bemba, Ruberwa, and I, don't, and I can remember the other two guys. No, he was not one of them. And, uh, it's, it's a, and the, the main task of this transitional government was to write a constitution, and, uh, which they did in 2005. It was endorsed and came into effect in 2006. And then uh, there were elections in the latter part of 2006 for the first time, as I, John, uh, mentioned that's uh, 40 years or so, and there was a lot of enthusiasm for this uh, these elections, and people were very much engaged, and expectations kind of went through the roof. That once you had elections and democracy was in place, everything was going to get better, and things were going to change, mm -hmm. and everything was going to be pretty good. So they have their first election or the first vote, and they, they, in those days you had two elections, and so there was a runoff between uh, Bimba. Um, Jean-Pierre Bimba and Kabila. And if you were in the Kinshasa area where you were, Bimba was the popular guy. Yes. Uh, he was the Lingala speaker. Kabila was really more popular in the eastern part of the country with, uh, with other ethnic groups. Vital Kamete was running his campaign out in the east and really packing up the votes. And uh, so there was a lot of disappointment when, when Bimba actually lost the election in Kinshasa and Ecuador province and those sort of areas. And the agreement was after the election, or they thought they had the agreement, is the four vice presidents had their own militias. And the ones that did not win would, uh, all those guys, the candidates and these four vice presidents, would either have their militias join the military or disband them. And they were, the agreement was they could keep about 20 people uh, for personal security. Everybody did that but Bimba. So what you have in, in March of 2007 is, I think, uh, no one's quite sure who started the thing, but the patients ran out. And there was a conflict in, uh, right along the Congo River in some of the nicer areas of Kinshasa. Um, the shelling started when, when the four uh, US, South African, Belgian, who I mean, and the British ambassadors were at Bimba's house, and the shelling started mm -hmm. at his house. Fortunately, those guys weren't hurt. Then Bimba went to the South African residence and stayed there for several months uh, before he got out of the country and went to Belgium. So th there were a lot of changes going on, and I showed up uh, about two or three months after you left. It was uh, kind of the, the late summer of, of 2007. And uh, the, 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 the violence that took place in March had a dramatic impact on Kinshasa. The, the, the guys with tanks in the U.S. and, the, and the, every corner had guys with guns from the United Nations set up and checkpoints and all that sort of stuff that all disappeared after Bimba's uh, troops were, were uh, defeated. And somewhere in the neighborhood of five or 600 people were killed in that several day period where you were in the, in the factory. It was pretty nasty stuff. And I think it, it went a long way to settle down Kinshasa proper, not the rest of the country, but Kinshasa became a much more stable and, and um, certainly more livable place by the time I got there. So you had a, a rather dramatic changes going on politically uh, in the Congo that had been at war since, basically since 1994. 
so things it did in fact improve quite a bit. Um, the, you know, then if, if you follow it through from 2006, Kabila took over. Uh, he was, you know, in, in, was declared a free and fair election, but not much changed. Not for the average Congolese. It was all it was all the same, and it continued. The fighting picked up in the eastern part of the country. The Rwandans and Ugandans were very much meddling in, in eastern Congo, and you know, the conflict minerals became very important. Coltan, which everybody in their cell phone, with, with your cell phone, you're contributing to the war in eastern Congo by buying those things. Um, that was fueled, and the fighting kept going, and, uh, and of course continues today hopefully at a much reduced level. But it was a, a very difficult time uh, for a, a lot of the Congolese who expected things to get better. And then on top of that, in 2007 and 2008, you had a dramatic spike in fuel and food prices and a drop in mineral prices. So uh, the ability to buy food, particularly in a place like Kinshasa, where virtually all of it's imported, uh, became very expensive. And uh, while the price spikes affected us here in Washington, and settled down after a while. They didn't settle down in the Congo. Those prices remained very high. And uh, I remember after I got there, um, we did a survey in the areas near where you lived. And the average income for a family per day was about 80 cents. And I think you've mentioned it in the book yeah. too. And we talked to a lot of folks who would tell their, their kids, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you eat. Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday, you eat. The other part of the family. And on Sunday, you're all on your own. Yeah, we don't know where you're going to get food. It was tough, tough living for, for the Congolese in, in Kinshasa. And I think, just to, to switch a little bit to the book, I'd, one of the things that I found very intriguing and very interesting is that it, it does detail kind of the struggles and the uh, coping mechanisms that families use to get by. Uh, it, it always struck me when I was there that things, <laughs> you think things can't get worse, and they do. Uh, or, or they were at that point in the Congo, but the, the population always figured out a way to survive, one way or another. Uh, the, this, this little scam or scheme or something, they would get by and survive. And uh, you detail that very nicely with the families um, and how they, how they get by and how they share expenses when it's funerals and things like that. Yeah. And they, they do have their problems with each other, with the, the ethnic groups, but they come together and uh, they, they depend on each other to survive. They have to. Um, so I think it's a very interesting book that's very, very thoughtful, uh, particularly in, in your uh, discussions of Bunya, which is so far from Kinshasa, but they still kind of look to Kinshasa as the capital. And um, one of the things, again, another theme that I, I noticed running through the book is sort of the legacy of the Belgian and Mobutu eras. You, you have a predatory military that, that has never been trained to protect the people. It's to protect the elite from the people and, and to take advantage of them uh, since they don't get paid regularly and those sorts of things. Ineffectual government, really lack of concern about government, no, no interest in infrastructure or any of those sorts of things. And so that's the kind of environment you have that, that was started with the Belgians and continued with a vengeance with, with Mobutu. And those, those, uh, those legacies last and are, are very acutely fact, uh, felt uh, by the population. But the one thing that Mobutu did, which always struck me as very interesting, is he created a sense of nationalism. And I think you mentioned that in there. You can be anywhere in the Congo and ask people who they are, and they'll say they're Congolese. Most other places I've been in Africa, they'll give you their ethnic group first, and then say, oh, Alan, I live in this country. Not in, in, not in the Congo. They, they're, they're all Congolese. And then they'll tell you what ethnic group they belong to. And I don't know quite how Mobutu did that, but it's, uh, you know, you hear a lot of discussion over time of uh, the Congo splitting up. You rarely hear that from Congolese. Those are expatriates who are convinced Katanga is going to split off or some other part is. Congolese never talk about that. I never heard anybody anyway. So. Just, just by way of a, a couple of introductory comments, and then uh, the, those are a couple of the themes I've, I saw through the book that I thought were very interesting and certainly rang true to form uh, when I got there. And the, the, the last one, I think you mentioned it too, is the, the elections. Everybody was excited about the elections in 2006 mm -hmm. and expected big things. Once democracy, meaning an election happened, things were going to get better. And there certainly, after you left, and if you go on a year or so, um, sort of the shock set in that 
nothing was changing. It didn't make any difference, even though they had elections, and they still had to cope and continue on with their, their process. So anyway, just a couple of comments. Yeah, I think that was, that was something that struck me, kind of the, the, the energy that's put into elections, but the complete absence of government in most people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. The government, uh, huge areas of the country have no government presence and, and you wonder, you wonder why it isn't worse even sometimes because we rely on government in our lives to keep order, keep the peace and, and if you believed Hobbes, uh, if you believed Hobbes, you, you would believe that the country should go to pieces but there are huge swaths of Congo uh, outside of the east which is very violent but huge swaths of Congo that are largely peaceful, you find a few bandits here and there, but they're largely getting by, doing trade, and uh, this is something marvelous. Uh, there is also the great expectation, I remember in, when I was in Bunia around the election, uh, the electricity went off, and I complained about it to the boy at the hotel, uh, at, the, at the convent I was staying at, and he said, don't worry, sir, as soon as we have elections, Congo will be like France and America, we'll have electricity. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> the electricity's still out yeah. there. I think. Yeah. Speaking of electricity, okay, now I'm on. <laughs> um, uh, you've, after Congo, you went and you moved to Rwanda, and you mm -hmm. lived there for four years. Now you're temporarily in, in, in Canada. So you went from kind of an undergoverned, yes. uh, or let's say a place where the, the government is not in people's lives, to a place that is uh, where the government is ever-present and uh, over-governed almost uh, in, in Rwanda. And I, I wonder um, you know, if, if, if that contrast strikes you, are you nostalgic at all for the days of, Kin, you know, kind of the liveliness of Kinshasa? You, you end the book, and, and it's, a, it's a pretty bleak look at Kinshasa, and it doesn't end kind of on a note of hopeful optimism. Um, but I wonder, as you've, as you've been there, you've seen the changes happening, kind of what's your, now that you've lived a bit longer in the region, have, have think, has your mind changed about certain things? The, 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 the difficult thing about Congo without government is that I found very few people were able to construct their sense of identity. Very few people were able to say, I am an author, I'm a journalist, or I, I, this is what I do. Even journalists had to rely on something else for their living, and everyone was running some kind of side business, selling telephone cards or something like that, because the economic structures and institutions were just not there to sustain any stable state uh, business or, or mode of living. And so it, that was very difficult, I found, uh, that experience, living among people who were constantly in search of themselves and in search of constructing who they were and not getting any help. Uh, in Rwanda, you almost had the opposite. The two countries are like night and day. And when I first arrived in Rwanda, I found it incredibly pleasant. The systems worked, the government was functioning, as you mentioned, electricity, water. For some of us, only 8% of the country has electricity. I was in that lucky 8%. Uh, but if you're in that lucky 8%, you don't realize what life is like for the rest of the country. Um, but it was interesting. In, in Rwanda, I met a, uh, one of the people I met was a genocide, <coughs> and one of the people who, couldn't, who killed during the genocide. Uh, of 1994, 20 years ago, almost exactly to this day. And w when I asked him what he felt, he had been a school teacher at the time, and then he had also killed. I asked him what he thought people should teach in Rwanda or should have taught to, to avoid the genocide. And he said human rights, and I thought, oh, this is just something he learned at school or learned it somewhere, and it's just a practice response. And then he later said, no, 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 you don't understand what I mean by human rights. Later in the conversation, he said, you don't understand what I mean by human rights. In Rwanda, I don't know where the state ends and where I begin. And that is very striking. It's a very sophisticated response, and that's the danger of a strong government. He was not able to affirm himself, he felt, and people were not, uh, in some sense, because the government was so powerful. 
And they felt, and if you, if you talk to them, there are all kinds of strange responses to the trauma of genocide. But if you talk to them, you've, you get the strong sense that somehow they didn't feel even that they were, uh, they were acting. That they, they, you could interpret it as, as a lack of responsibility, but you felt that they were not able to construct themselves in the way that they would have wished, and therefore to act in the way that they would wish. Uh, it's a long conversation to have, but so you see the, the, the complications of both states, of uh, mm -hmm. an absence of government and a government that's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know we don't have a whole lot of time. Bill, did you have a? No, we, go ahead. We, we can answer. Uh, open up to questions, and um, if you could just identify yourself, um, we'll take the lady there in the aisle. Hi, my name is Mary Ann Stein. I'm a board member of the Fund for Global Human Rights, and we fund human rights organizations in the DRC, um, as well as a number of other places. And we're, our focus is in the East, in the Kivus primarily. Um, and there, it seems to me, <coughs> there is a, um, still a lot of violence and fighting. In fact, the day I left Goma was the day the M23 came in and was <coughs> murdering, raping, looting, et cetera. Um, but I, I'm interested to know whether you had any experiences with any local um, organizations, NGOs, human rights groups, et cetera, because part of my feeling is that the answer in so many of these countries isn't just with the government. Governments do sometimes tend to overreach. Um, in fact, most of them do. Um, and without strong local organizations, the people who keep their governments accountable and demand the kinds of things they need. I'm not sure those things happen. So I'd be really interested to know what your sense was of civil society mm -hmm. in, um, in what you experienced in the DRC. Thank you, that's a great question. Uh, often in our narratives of Congo, we we, des we describe the horror and the war and the conflict and the difficulty of people's lives. We sometimes, I think, overlook the fact that there are good people, uh, talented people who are committed to the development of their country and uh, who really do care and who are forced into compromised situations because there are few avenues available, <coughs> few, few institutions that allow their efforts to add up. But in my experience, almost in every little town, every little village, I would find people who could speak intelligently about their needs, about uh, what they wanted from the government, uh, and what they, what they felt had to be built at that time. They had thought through. They didn't just spend their time surviving. They, they really took the time to step back and think about the bigger picture. And what you say about civil society groups holding government accountable is essential. And I do, my own personal feeling is that <coughs> a, a, a chronic lack of information is responsible for, for a, a consistent lack of understanding for, of the problems in each area. Each, the regions <coughs> are all different. They all have their unique problems. There are land issues in one area, infrastructure in another conflict and other minerals. And so what we really would do well to do, and people are doing this, or groups are doing this, is to build local information networks. And I do believe that that would be a first step to understanding even the violations that are occurring, uh, not just the symptoms, but the causes. And then from there, I do think there are good people on the ground with whom it's possible to work to address some of the problems of overreach of government or, or uh, lack of authority even. Uh, soldiers act with impunity uh, outside the chain of command are never, never brought to justice. So these are, the, these are the fundamentals, like building the fundamental institutions, justice, press, a parliament that is somehow representative and, and represents people. If, if these basic things uh, could be 
aided, we would do well far far better, I think, than than uh, treating symptoms of of the violence, which is important in 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 the moment, but I think uh, doesn't do enough to prevent those crises from occurring and recurring. Maybe we'll take a few um, at a time. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Nia Kwete. I um, work on uh, U.S. relations with Africa here in Washington. Um, I, my, my question, actually, I think is a very good uh, mirror image of the first question about civil society responsibility. But here I'm looking at civil society in the U.S. Um, you know, you came to my notice in your essay in Politico about the darling tyrant, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Kagame. And what strikes me is that the Congo is in shambles when it was ruled by a tyrant backed by the US, uh, Mobutu. And now we have phase two, where in my opinion, in Rwanda, which is a strong state, but is, is messing up in the, messing the Congo up, and it's also backed by the US. And so as an African living here, what I keep thinking is, what I would love to see, and I, it rings a bell with me about lack of information, because I keep thinking the U.S. is a great democracy. The people will hold the government accountable if, if they only knew some of the terrible governments that the U.S. backs. But to my mind, the story about Kagame is very different. You know, he was implicated in the killing of people in South Africa, the five million, you talk about all kinds of things. And the US issued a statement, but the next week he was in California giving speeches. So I feel like the American people, if they knew and told their government, we don't want you backing bad leaders in Africa, it will stop. So I wonder how you would uh, react to that for better information so that ordinary Americans can hold their government responsible. Thank you very much. Uh, great. Let's take, uh, uh, let's take three questions. Uh, so the gentleman here and then one. Uh, Peter Humphrey, I'm an intelligence analyst. If you had, let's say, oh, two million bucks to throw at the problem of the DROC and you wanted to turn things around, would you buy 100,000 cheap laptop computers? Would you open an Oprah-style academy for bright young women? Would you do teacher training in, in situ? Would you do uh, a few hundred grad students coming to the U.S. in hopes that they'll return and turn things around? Um, would, you do, uh, would you just simply hire more teachers out in the countryside? You know, if, here's two million bucks. Give me the most efficacious use of this money to, to turn this country around in one generation. Yes, I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Lucas, and I've traveled through that part of Africa as well. Um, and I was wondering, you said how difficult it would be to make policy from that far away, but did you come away with some general ideas of what we could be doing better in terms of our policy? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think they're all linked in some way. And I'd be interested to hear what Ambassador Goebbeling thinks about American support. Uh, yeah, yes, I would be curious. But if, I think the three questions are linked in, uh, in a fundamental way. And, if, if, and I think the central question is, if you had money to spend, how would you spend it? What policy would you implement? Uh, and in my mind, I, I, I would come back to a network of reliable journalists and a, a, an, an organization that actually functions, offers them career, uh, offers them a, a hope of, uh, uh, of, of building that career in journalism, uh, and, and which they can use to inform their communities 
and also us, the international journalists, because we don't get a lot done without local journalists. Uh, I was listening to the radio every day. Congo is a huge country, half the size of Europe. Uh, and I was one of four foreign journalists. And every morning I would listen to the, to the radio and I would read the papers. And without those local journalists sort of uh, on the pounding the pavement in their little towns, uh, I would have learned very little. Uh, it would have been much, much, infinitely harder. And, uh, and, it, uh, and this, this feeds into a larger question. If we can allow the stories of the Congolese to be told by them through those journalistic institutions. Uh, I think we will go a long way towards understanding them better and also helping them identify not only their problems but their own solutions. Any, any, the problems of Congo are, are have a strong Congolese component to them. The, the solution must come from Congo, and what we can do is to facilitate that. And there are organizations on the ground in Congo building those journalist networks. We don't have to re reinvent the wheel. There are, uh, Internews is working there with uh, UN radio stations. Uh, indispensable, reliable, objective information. Uh, and, and, but that's only the beginning, I think, of a larger, uh, more extensive, and a network that begins to inform us about the kinds of things that I describe in the book that don't often make it to world news because they're deemed unimportant. And they're deemed unimportant because we don't understand the situation. It's a vicious cycle. And, uh, and yes, I'd be curious to <laughs> sort of hear ambassadors. Well. <laughs> Well, now that I'm not in the government anymore, I can <laughs> say a few different sorts of things. I, first of all, if you're going to just lumping all these things together, if you're going to deal the problems, with the problem, deal with the problems of the Congo, it's a regional problem. It's not just a Congolese problem. So I think the U.S. government and the British government, and particularly the Belgians and the South Africans, perhaps, have to be a little more forceful in holding not only the Congo but the neighboring countries accountable for what they do. And we've spent a lot of time uh, not doing that. And I think <clears throat> what's, happening, uh, what's happened in the Congo in the past year is interesting. It's been a pretty good year um, for the Democratic Republic of Congo. The M23 movement was defeated. Uh, the UN is engaged in a much larger way than ever before, even with an intervention brigade, which is a very good idea. And there's a bigger network of envoys that are engaged. Um, Feingold from the United States, uh, Robinson, and, and these folks have played a far bigger role in the past year in dealing with the issues in Eastern Congo in particular than any group has in the past. And I think you're seeing a little bit of a difference now. Uh, President Kabila has removed about 100 generals uh, uh, from, from uh, uh, moved them to Kinshasa and they're still there. Uh, they've been replaced with much more effective generals. There's a long way to go. I'm not trying to minimize the problems. But changes have been underway. And I think for the first time in a long time, there is international interest and support for not only helping the Congo, but dealing with the regional issues and engaging the Rwandans and engaging the Ugandans and even Burundi and some of the others saying, enough of this. I remember a meeting with a foreign minister when I first got there, and they said, you know, we don't have any friends. We don't have any allies in, in our region. Everybody likes the Congo just the way it is, so they can rip it off. And there's a certain amount of truth to that, and I think particularly the U.S. and the British have tolerated that for a very long time and just not dealt with the issue. And hopefully now, uh, beginning with Senator Feingold and his role and the others, uh, we're, we're starting to call people to account. And I think that's, that's a start. Uh, we got a long ways to go, but that's a start. What would you do with $2 million? First of all, it's peanuts. <laughs> yeah, $200 million. You, you could uh, begin doing things. But one group that I always thought uh, and worked with as much as we could uh, in the Eastern Congo uh, was women's groups. I think that the power of women in Eastern Congo has not been utilized. They're the, they're the group that holds the country together. They, they, they're the glue that runs Eastern Congo and makes things happen, whether from a business point of view or a social point of view. And if you could link women's groups from Rwanda, Uganda, 
and Kigali together, I think you could have a big impact. The way I know when I was there, we brought uh, some, some women leaders from Sierra Leone and Liberia who were pretty effective to the Congo for discussions with, with Congolese women. And I think that's just an untapped source that can have a very big impact on what's going on in the Eastern Congo. We just haven't, haven't, haven't really utilized that. So Great. I'm avoiding <laughs> some of it. <the laughs> I think we have a couple, two more questions, five more minutes. Tammy? Uh, Mike is coming. I'm Tammy Holtman from AllAfrica.com, a Pan-African news organization that posts over 2,000 articles a day from over 130 African news organizations and hundreds of civil society groups and NGOs. I read your book straight through. I couldn't put it down. However, your presentation tonight is going to force me to go back to it and reassess my reaction to it which was almost entirely negative. <laughs> and I'm trying to reconcile those two things. And I think part of my concern is that your instincts towards and your abilities to be a compelling personal storyteller. The book is beautifully written, as all the reviewers have said, tends to obscure for people who don't know Congo or Africa, the facts that you presented here and tends to reinforce the stereotypes of Africa as a helpless, hopeless place. Do you have any of those concerns? Am I just wrong? Do I need to reread it from cover to cover? <laughs> That's a fair question. I, the purpose of the book was always to say to readers, I, like you, have read these 200 word stories in newspapers uh, from very far away. Uh, often these stories about famine, about <coughs> war, about <coughs> rape. And like you, probably, I sense that there's something far deeper going on. There's more to be learned. And so I'm going to go there. And you can sort of sit on my shoulder and you can witness the things that I witness, and you can draw your own conclusions about them. So that it would have been very easy, and this, was, this is where the book differs from how I present the Congo. It would have been much easier for me to write a book that was authoritative. Say, I have been in the Congo. I know these things about the Congo. Let me teach them to you, or let me present them to you. And it's not what you think, or I know better. And that really was never the purpose. The purpose was to start from a common understanding that we have a common uh, perception that exists in the world because of the news media, largely, and what we absorb. It's not anyone's fault. We are absorbed to what we are absorbed every day. Uh, what we are exposed to what we are exposed every day, and we can't be blamed for that. And, but we will start from there, and we will probe the country and go through it and, and, for, and see, uh, for example, a militiaman who was once a nurse. And I think, I, I think the sort of perceptions of Africa, I think when you go to a place, I think it's important to go there without <coughs> prejudice, without perceptions, good or bad. And I think the danger with thinking that, oh, this is the prevailing perception of, Af of Africa, I want to change that, I think there's a danger to that because I think you can be dishonest. And I think my purpose was to go there to see what I saw and to narrate it in a, in a straightforward and honest way. And I think without, by going there with a, by not being sent by someone or with any predefined purpose other than to learn the story behind those 200 word stories, there was a certain purity to my venture. And that was really the purpose of the book. As I say, it is kind of strikingly honest in that way, that you don't kind of put a gloss on your experience or kind of draw the big conclusions. You're left at the end of the book kind of saying, what does this, you know, what's the future here? What's, what's the mm -hmm. conclusion? And it's hard to draw one, in fact. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's have uh, one more or two more. Uh, Margo in the back. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marie-Claire Gonda. I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
Good to see you, Ambassador. <laughs> and the two other vice presidents at uh, Kabila time were Yerodia and Zaidi Ngoma. Yes, Just thank, to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank um, you. I'm very happy uh, that we're having this conversation. I do believe that by having conversation, that's, that's the way we find solutions. And I do believe that Congolese and, uh, uh, want a uh, solution, want to find, have peace in our country. And if only we have a chance to do that, uh, we are willing to work for it. I do believe America has a big role to play. I sit here and I listen to everybody um, almost afraid to, to speak the truth. Uh, I see what's going on in Ukraine. CNN keep talking about it every single day. What's going on there? Why we don't talk about Congo? Why people are afraid to talk about what, what's going on in Congo? especially that it's been going on for almost 20 years. And up to today, I still hear people asking, what's going on in Congo? Five million people die in Congo. Women are brutally raped on a daily basis. And we have the largest peacekeeping uh, in the eastern part of the Congo. We have NGO, we have all of that. And my question is, why is it so much, is it so difficult? Why we have the silence? The, the, the people in Congo, and especially the women, I, I do believe the ambassador mentioned the role of the women in Congo. We want peace. You cannot build a country where there is no peace. You cannot talk about election, election where there is no peace, there is no security. Women don't feel secure. I, I believe a lot of people in the Congo do not feel secure. Now, if you don't feel secure, you cannot have a sense of wanting to build a long-lasting place where you can live. So my question again is, why is America so silent with what's been going on in the Congo? Why are we afraid to talk about this? So that's my question. <laughs> In New York Times? <laughs> uh, I think, and this is, I, mean, I agree with you, I think we, we should talk more about this, and talking about it is a first step to, to helping to resolve it, uh, or helping the Congolese to resolve it, because it is their work, I think, to build their country and build their future. I think that there are multiple things going on. Uh, and perhaps at least talked about among them is the fact that we do bear some relation to what is going on in Congo. Uh, Congo is part of the global supply chain for many products, uh, electronics and things like that. And, and, uh, and since sort of the colonial years, more than 100 years, the world has been complicit in some of the, the, the crises that have occurred in the Congo. And that takes a great deal of courage to confront. Because it's like looking at yourself and looking at your own flaws and, and, try, and giving them a good hard look and looking them you know, straight, straight up. And, and, uh, and that's not something humans do very easily. Uh, and I do think that's part of, of why we tend to turn away because it is painful to look, not only because of the suffering that we see, but because we are complicit. And the world is complicit, not we as individuals, but the world is complicit. The systems that we are part of, that we rely on, are complicit in what's going on there. Uh, just the last word, it, 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 it was striking to me, the Central African Republic is now in the middle of a great war, just north of Congo. And I wanted to go there to report it, it is still incredibly difficult to get people interested in uh, what is going on in these places. No matter the scale of the catastrophe, the Central African Republic is something of Syrian proportions. But for a variety of reasons, either, oh yes, this is not news because Africa's always been like this, or this is not news because Africa is now rising, so we don't want to hear about this. Uh, both those are guilty. And, uh, 
and, and also the fact that we are complicit. I think all those things together make this cocktail of, of forces that want us to turn away. And, uh, and I don't blame people. It's, it's a normal human reaction. Yeah, just, just to add, I agree completely. And to add a couple of comments, the Congo, where, where this fighting is going on in Eastern Congo is in the middle of Africa. It's a hard place to get to, so it's hard to cover uh, for journalists and for the media. You know, it's, it's, it's sad to say, but it's not on the top 10 list of U.S. foreign policy objectives. It is on our humanitarian objectives, but you know, the Congo doesn't figure in as a, as a key foreign policy issue for the United States. And that's unfortunate, but that's how the United States deals with this sort of thing. And then the other uh, factor that I sort of noticed when I was spending a lot of time in the Congo, and I'd come back and forth uh, to meet with members of Congress and in the State Department, there's not a big constituency um, in, the, in the United States that's focused on the Congo, not like Sudan. Mm -hmm where you've got anti-slavery people and all this other, there's no big constituency that is vocal all the time on Capitol Hill and in the State Department with the Congo. It, it, it's, just, it's just not there. So you add those things together and it doesn't take much to divert attention to the Ukraine or some other place. And uh, I always kind of cringe when everybody says, this is the worst crisis going on in the world. They keep referring to Syria. Well, actually it's not. <laughs> it's the Congo. And, uh, but, but our, it seems like our attention span is only one or two things at a time, too, and it's Ukraine and Syria right now. And, and so, and, and then you've got CAR there, a perpetual thing that people don't know what to do about called the Congo. It's unfortunate, and it, it's, it's that's, that's not a, uh, I think that's sort of, there's a few realities. It doesn't, that's not an excuse. I mean, we should be very much focused on the Congo and, and, and what's going on there. I do think, and I, I agree with kind of the U.S. complicity and the skewing of incentives for governance and the Cold War and the current kind of regional interests. I, I think in, within Africa policy, I do think Congo is getting more attention than it has in the past. And it's partly a result of uh, groups that were active on Sudan kind of expanding their scope, you know, for better or for worse, kind of the celebrity element that brings some attention. Complicated thing with, it, with Congo, it's hard to identify good and bad and who's right and who's wrong and, and disentangle this into a narrative that can capture the public and capture a policymaker and say, all you have to do is X. You know, and I, 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 I genuinely like your idea of kind of that building that network of information that kind of draws out some of the complexity that allows people, you know, to really mm -hmm. get a much better sense of, of what's going on and maybe some of the options for, for influence and, and leverage. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's still low down on the, on the totem pole. I do think there's some good energetic people beginning to focus and Senator Feingold has actually done some really interesting kind of serious uh, work on this. So um, it's, not, it's not a hopeless case. Um, and uh, you know, I hope that your, your book begins to contribute to that kind of momentum that's growing in terms of looking much more seriously and uh, getting tougher with regional powers, getting tougher, tougher with uh, Kabila himself as well. Um, we're at time. I just want to thank you, Anton, for um, you. coming and raising the issue, and, and Ambassador Garvelink. Really, uh, it's 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 very beautifully written book. And even if you come out slightly depressed, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to look for your next book uh, as well. Um, but uh, thank you again, and please join me in in thanking Anjan and, and Ambassador. <laughs>